Welcome to Magic Arcanum. I'm Ryan Gomez. Behind the scenes is Nicole Letson, and we are so glad you're here because it's story time. Theros Beyond Death contains 10 sagas, enchantments that tell a story over several turns. And since we're all about stories here on Magic Arcanum, we thought it'd be fun to take a look at what's going on in each of these cards. First though, let me say thank you to everyone who helps make this show possible through their support on Patreon. It's a cool way to get your name in the credits and join the fun we have over on our exclusive Discord server, so if you haven't done so yet, go ahead and check it out using the link down below. Okay, so sagas. Let's start by explaining what makes them special. Sagas first appeared in a set called Dominaria, a plane with a very long, long history, even by magic standards. They proved to be quite popular, and for the most part, everyone was happy to see them come back again here on Theros. As I said, sagas tell a story, but it's important to recognize it's a story from the past. Let me explain. With other enchantments, when you cast them, they happen now. You are, in effect, creating a story as you go. So, for example, if you cast pacifism on an opponent's questing beast, what you're really saying is, In this tale of battle between two powerful planeswalkers, the summoned questing beast has lost his desire to fight. When you cast a saga, though, it's more like, Hey, remember that time Nicol Bolas was dead and then came back from the dead and ruined everyone's day? Because that totally happened. So just keep that in mind as we talk about these cards. They are describing things that happened before you sat down to play this game and before most of what's going on in the current magic story. To really illustrate my point, the first saga we're going to look at is the Binding of the Titans. Thousands of years ago, Titans walked the plain of Theros, sowing death and destruction everywhere they went. In their desperation, the citizens of Theros prayed for someone to help them, and those prayers were answered by the gods. The gods defeated the titans, and Clothis volunteered to act as their warden, sealing them away in the underworld, never to bother mortals again. So that's Clothis in the art there, with chains around Croxa and Euro. The three chapters of this saga represent the fall of the Titans and the exile preventing them from ever escaping. Kind of a weak connection, I admit, but I wanted to start with this saga because it's a good representation of how stories from a long time ago appear on cards today. Each color got two sagas in Theros Beyond Death, so let's jump over to the other green one, the first Iroan Games. This is a reference to the ancient Olympic Games, which began as a tribute to the Greek god Zeus. On Theros, however, it is a celebration of Iroas, the god of victory. The verses on this saga first create your competitor, who will then grow in strength as they train, and that training becomes experience, which is represented by the knowledge you gain from drawing cards. And then finally, you can earn a gold medal for your performance. Now, the card Arena Athlete from our first visit to Theros specifically says that the Aroan Games do not award medals, but remember, sagas tell stories from the past, so it's possible that they used to award medals, but have since stopped doing so. The arena that houses the Iroan Games is located in a city called Akros, which has its own saga, the Acroan War. Just in case you missed out on the 2004 cinematic masterpiece that was Troy, this is Magic's version of the Trojan War. This one is interesting to me for two reasons. One, on our first visit to Theros, we got the Acroan horse standing in for the well-known Trojan horse, which tells me that this saga did not happen that long ago. And two, the art for this one is unfinished. It's supposed to be a tapestry, and since that last frame is empty, it means whoever was weaving it didn't get to finish yet or possibly died before they could complete their work. Which kind of makes sense given that this saga is talking about a giant war between two cities. 
Anyway, the other red saga is the triumph of Anax, who was the king of Akros. Now, presently, Anax is the chosen demigod champion of Perforos, but before that, he defended Akros from an assault by Xenagos. There, he stood his ground against Rordon the Rageblood, a minotaur oracle of Mogus. This saga is a retelling of their epic fight. The birth of Melitus gives us the story of the founding of another great city on Theros. Long ago, after the Titans, but before now, Theros had an Archon problem. These Archons were fearsome tyrants, and they ruled over huge sections of the plain. The god Aphara blessed the citizens of Melitus and gave them the strength to overthrow one such Archon. They in turn reclaimed the land, built upon it, and wound up with a prosperous city. So that's Afara in the art, and everything that happens on this card, from the land you find, to the walls you build, to the life you gain, represents everything that went into the creation of the great city of Melitus. There is another white saga, but I'm going to save that one for later. Instead, let's jump over to blue and look at Metomai's prophecy. Metomai is a sphinx, and he visited Melitus several times to warn them about upcoming dangers. Now, I'm not sure what those warnings actually were. It's possible he foresaw the breach of the underworld or Heliod trying to erase all the references to the other gods, but I can't say for sure. That's part of the fun of prophecies, though. A lot of the time, you don't understand what they are when you get them, and even if you do, you're usually powerless to change whatever is going to actually happen. So I think this saga does a pretty good job of representing the cryptic nature of this Sphinx and his prophecies. And I gotta tell you, seeing that the top card of your opponent's deck is another land when their hand is already empty, oh, that's a great feeling. I'm actually working on a deck that makes that feeling happen as often as it can. And if that's something you'd be interested in, maybe you want to see the deck list, come on over to the Patreon page because that is where I share all those extra goodies. Blue also gets Kiora Best's The Sea God, which is another pretty recent story event, at least as far as the history of Theros goes. The planeswalker Kiora was looking for weapons she could use against the Eldrazi, who were running loose on her home plane of Zendikar. Being a merfolk, Kiora sought power from the sea, and that's where she encountered Thassa, god of Cheddar Bay Biscuits. Note to self, do not write scripts close to lunchtime. Anyway, Kiora decides that the Bident Thassa has would make an excellent weapon to use against the Eldrazi, so she comes at her with every kraken and octopus and blooper she can muster. In the end, Thassa was beaten and her Bident was taken. But she, like, wasn't crying, guys. It was just salt water, okay? Okay? Timurette calls the dead. Hey, he just met you, and this is crazy. But he's the murder king, so raid with him, maybe? Timuret is currently the chosen demigod champion of Erebos, god of the dead, and he got that job by, really, having the perfect resume for it. As the leader of Odunos, he was well positioned to gather up the most skilled warriors among the returned and lead them in nighttime raids against the living. Odunos is another city on Theros, but instead of having nice walls or games celebrating athleticism, it's more of a truck stop on the side of the highway for anyone escaping from the underworld. But you know who couldn't escape from the underworld? The planeswalker Elspeth. Now, I already did a video just on her, so go check that one out if you're not familiar with her story, because I'm going to assume you already know her as I talk about these last two sagas. We'll start with Elspeth's nightmare. While trapped in the underworld, Elspeth had to endure a sort of dream torture at the hands, claws, mm, hands of Ashiok Nightmare Muse. Ashiok forced Elspeth to relive some of the most traumatic events from her own past, each captured here on the saga. There's the time she accidentally killed her lover Daxos, who only had two power. There's the torture she had to endure living on a plane filled with Phyrexians. 
And there's her own death at the hands of Heliod with no hope for escape. The art shows Elspeth being held by a Phyrexian obliterator with the chains behind her representative of her predicament on Theros. Also in the art there is the Shadow Spear, which wound up being the key to Elspeth getting out of the underworld. And that brings us to the final saga, Elspeth Conquers Death. In this one, we can see her standing over Ashiok and Erebos, triumphant in her escape from the underworld. Now, if your opponent played Elspeth's Nightmare against you on turn three, and you played this on turn five, you could exile their saga before its third verse triggered and exiled your graveyard, which is kind of a flavor win. From there, we see a representation of people starting to believe more in Elspeth than they do in Heliod. The idea being, if you mess with Elspeth, you will pay. And then the final verse is her coming back to life, ready to take on her next adventure. Much to the annoyance of Calix and Clothis, but that is a story for another time. So there you go, the ten sagas from Theros Beyond Death and the stories behind them. If you stuck with me this far, you must be waiting for the Mustache Minute. So get ready, because here we go! I feel like the story behind Kiora beating Thassa has been exaggerated over time. Kiora made a 9-9 Kraken token, but it's like everyone's saying, No, 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 it wasn't that big. It was just, you couldn't hit it with anything. Not even with your crossbow, Steve. I see a lot of similarities between Elspeth Conquers Death and The Eldest Reborn, which I used to loop in a deck with Golgari Finebroker, but now I can just stay in one color and use Lagona Band Storyteller, which, you know, respect to my fellow storyteller. I actually had both of those cards in my pool at the pre-release, and watching one of my opponents realize the futility of trying to break that cycle was pretty decent. Triumph of Anax feels backwards. He was defending the city, so why does he spend three turns getting pumped up and then shrinking back down to fight somebody? This card should have made it harder for your opponent to attack you, and like the longer you hold the line, the better your defenses get. Plus, a red card with no reference to the hot gates? Come on, that's a missed opportunity. Whew, that's enough of that. So what's your favorite saga, hmm? Let me know down in the comments, and then make sure you like this video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the great stories you'll only find here on Magic Arcanum. I'll see ya!